give him a round of applause. Uh, man, it's good to see everyone here. Uh, I will tell you this morning, it may not be a feel good. It's, uh, it's one of those things where we know that truth sets us free. Can I get an amen? amen? And we need to hear the truth, and sometimes the truth does hurt a little bit. But know that the truth, when it comes to set us free, sometimes that happens in a, in a, in a tough way. I will say this, that as we start going over this scripture, I understand that we're preparing for the Christmas season. It's December, and, and we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But I think a lot of times we've romanticized what the birth of Jesus Christ is. We actually kind of made it something that it's not. And so I just want to kind of get us right back into to the mode of understanding what has taken place? And Pastor Allen read a scripture about what Jesus said about John the Baptist. And understand within the Christmas story, before Jesus came, Isaiah spoke of one coming from the wilderness who will make straight the path for Jesus. Now, a lot of us, I have no idea what's making so much noise. Okay. A lot of us, if you're like me, I want to do great in the eyes of the Lord, right? I want, I want more of God and I want to be used by him. And many of us desire this. If not all of us, we desire more of God. But what we don't understand and able to get more of God, there has to be less of us. And that's why the sermon is called Decrease for Increase. You want more of God, you got to get less of you. And that's hard for us. And it's hard for me. It's hard for everyone who's human because, man, we're trying to take care of us, right? Our ways, we think they're great. Uh, many times we come up with ideas that we're like, this is amazing, and I am so smart. <laughs> Only to follow through that idea and realize, that eh, wasn't a good idea. <laughs> God says my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And he says not to lean on our own understanding, but to lean on his which is easier said than done. So today I want to I want to kind of go over John the Baptist and understand that I could go on for a long time about John the Baptist, but we're going to have to probably just paraphrase some things. But there's something that John the Baptist his life has taught us that we need to understand today. And he is the one who said, "I must decrease so that Christ can increase." Now, let me tell you how John came to be. His dad's name was Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest. He was married to Elizabeth. Elizabeth was barren. She could not give birth to children. And back in those days, if you couldn't give birth to a son, you were ridiculed and you were kind of an outcast as a woman. Now, Zechariah was a priest, and, and it was his turn for him and his priest to go to the temple and do the services for God at the temple. Now, one of the services for God at the temple was to go in and light incense in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. That is a dangerous place. Because back then, theologians believe they used to tie ropes around the waist of the priests who were elected to go in and light incense just in case their life wasn't good, they would die. So today, I'd like to ask, who would like to go in? Many of us in this room are like, I can't. Had a tough Saturday. <laughs> right? Well, they decided that it was Zachariah's turn to go in. So they pray for Zachariah. The other priests are covering him. And, and I wonder if somebody forgot the rope. And they're like, no, Zachariah's good. He'll be fine. So he goes in and he lights incense. But he's in there a long time. A long time. To the point, I wonder if the priests outside are like, dude, he's gone. He's dead. Dude, he is absolutely laid out dead. Next thing you know, Zachariah starts coming out. And they're like, Zachariah, what happened? And Zachariah's like, they're like, dude, quit holding it. Come on, tell us what happened. You're in there forever. Well, Zachariah can't talk. Because what has happened Zechariah went in to light incense, and an angel showed up. And Zechariah was like, well, I guess it's the end of me. <laughs> and the angel says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Listen to me. Your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son. 
and you will name him John because he's the one Isaiah spoke about. He will make straight the path of the Messiah. Guys, listen to me. Here's what Zechariah says to the angel. You're mistaken. My wife's too old. She can't have kids. <laughs> to where the angel said, bro. Well, he didn't say bro. <laughs> but the angel said, my name is Gabriel. I stand next to God, the Almighty. And he told me to come and tell you what's about to happen. And because of your mouth, your disbelief, you can't speak until this child is born. And you know, John was like, <laughs> can't do it. I'm going to take poor Zachariah. Because you know he went back home. And his wife is like, what happened? <laughs> John's like, why are you ignoring me right now? I'm going to tell you right now. You better not give me that silent treatment. I don't understand why you do this. You do this all the time. <laughs> and you know, John's just like, ooh. Finally gets a tablet and says, you about to get pregnant. <laughs> to where I'm sure Elizabeth is like, you don't have it like that anymore, big guy. <laughs> you had to explain a little bit more. Welcome to the refuge. Just this is your first time. <laughs> Those of you who are watching on Facebook, amen. amen. So he has to write out, no, an angel came and he said, you're going to get pregnant. This and, and behold, the, she gets pregnant. And, and she's amazed. And she can't believe this is a moving of God. It's a beautiful thing. And then John is born. Now, understand, when John is growing up, they're, they're telling him, you are a miracle. You are a miracle. An angel spoke to your dad, and you're going to do great things. And, and sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we hear those things, right? We hear people say, you're going to do great things in God. And, and God even says, I'm going to do great things in you. And here comes the problem. We start getting magic magnifying minds. And we start creating ways how God should use us. And when we really are honest with ourselves, those thoughts aren't of God, they're ours. We want God to do what we think is awesome for our benefit. Which what we're asking God is to increase in our life so we can increase. doesn't work that way. And that's modern Christianity. Can I get an amen? amen. Understand, we're going to learn something from John the Baptist that is a harsh teaching, but if you really want more of God... Get less of you. And you're going to be a part of something that he is doing that you cannot explain. And I can prove it. How many of you in this room are not the same person that you were five years ago? How many of you can say you're not the same person you were ten years ago? Right? Now, if I ask you, how did you do that? You're not going to be able to tell me. And if you really understand, you'll go, I really don't know. What I'd like for you to say is, well, it was when I started going to the refuge. <laughs> and I started tithing more than I was supposed to. Can I get an amen? amen? That's when my life changed. But that's not it. It's when we absolutely come to God and we're going to learn about what John came saying. This is very important. This is in Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 2. It's a little bit long, but just listen to me. Luke chapter 3, starting with verse 2. During the high priesthood, priesthood of Anas and Cephas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching, listen to this, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, a prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill be made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough roads will become smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, listen to this, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. 
Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Listen to this. The crowd said, what should we do then? John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should share and do the same with those who have none. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. They said, teacher, what should we do? He said, don't collect more than you are required to, he told them. Then even soldiers came and said, what should we do? And he said, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all. He said, I'll baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not even worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Now let's stop. I know that was a lot, but really look what happened. John comes out of the wilderness and he begins to say, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's right here. And it's time to repent for the forgiveness of sins. It's time to repent, right? And we, we've heard this all the time. And, and what happened is people started coming to John and saying, wait a second. You mean you can help us be baptized into repentance for the forgiveness of sins? And we don't have to go through the religious people. We don't have to go through Jerusalem. We don't have to go through the priests. We don't have to go through all the things that we've been outcast from doing. But just hear me. Back then, the church turned into something it should not have ever been. The church turned into something it should never have been. It was no longer about God's people. It was no longer about the hurting. But it was about the glorification of the temple. To the point they were changing money at the church. And if you don't know what that means, they were selling things called indulgences. Which I'm telling you right now, if we were to bring that back today, Refuge would have no financial issues. <laughs> Say, wait a second, what's an indulgence? Well, what an indulgence was, you go ahead and come to refuge on Thursday. We're going to sell you a couple of doves for the junk you're going to do this weekend. And then you'll be freed up. You mean they're selling, quote, forgiveness before? Yeah. That's how bad it was. And so here comes John going, no. Come and be baptized the repentance of sin. Because salvation is here. The cost is going to be paid. And the people came and they said, even for us, John? Notice he said this to them. You brood of vipers, who warned you to come and escape the wrath of God? How many of you think those are offensive words? Right? You're like, you brood of vipers, right? I don't even like snakes. But here's what he was saying. Who told you to come and repent? And that's important. Because the Holy Spirit, listen to me, whether you're a believer or not, is always moving. Amen. Moving with the conviction of love Amen. to bring you to repentance. Some of us call it um, kind of our conscience, right? We like to call it that. Sometimes we think it's an angel or a devil on our shoulders. But the truth is, the Holy Spirit is always saying, if you're listening... And even sometimes when you're not listening, don't do that. Some of you in this room will say, sure wish I would have listened. 
It has saved me a lot of trouble. Don't do that. Repent. Come back. Right? And I'm not here to force you to come back. It's your decision. But don't come back unless it's time for repentance. You see, here's something that I, I just learned this week. And it, it messed me up. Because my birthday was this week. And I turned 50. No, shh. I had a problem with turning 30, and I had an even bigger problem turning 50. And here's why. And I'm going to be very transparent with you. Shut your mouth, Brad. I get that a lot. No, you keep it. Watch him. Give him his pills. Once again, if this is your first time at Refuge, welcome to Refuge. You know, if you... If you're not getting picked on here, you're not loved. But anyway, <laughs> here's the reality of it. I'm a very, I, when I get to these points, my brain looks back and I'm my worst critic. Right? Because I've always had plans. And in my mind, I'm like, you got to be, you got to be here and you got to be here. And by this time, this is, has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, then you're a failure. And I beat myself up all the time by going, I should be better. I should be better. I should be better. And, man, I finally got to the point this week where I was like, God, what, what is the deal? And God says, man, you're either going to listen to me or you're not, Travis. He said, I was telling you this when you turned 30 and you haven't learned it yet. Quit comparing yourself to other people. It's not about who you become in the world. It's about who you become in me. Amen. And it's hard for me, right, because I'm always comparing myself to somebody else. And it, it really is. It's, it's a culture of comparison, and it, it, it's a tool of the enemy that I just jump into all the time. Right. Now, hear me on this. There's been many times I've gone to God and said, I'm sorry, but I didn't repent. There's a difference between telling God you're sorry and repentance. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't understand that Christ died on the cross so that you can repent, which means change your behavior, which means turn from what you were doing. To repent is to come and say, I am sorry, Lord, and I declare, not, I might even use the word declare, I choose out of my own will to change this behavior. Now, how many of you in this room, including myself, have tried to change your behavior and it just didn't work out? I, this is going to help you out so much. He is the changer of your behavior. Amen. Your job is to believe that you can be changed. Amen. Now, follow me here. Here John is, and he is telling them, it is more than just performing. It is more than just going to church. It is more than just singing praise and worship songs. It's more than getting an emotional feel. It's about repentance at the cross. Because you can't trust who Jesus is unless you understand that he came to change your life. Amen. He didn't come to create a nice culture for you to exist in. To where you're now, you're now popular and people see you as something awesome and, and you're spiritual, right? And it seems like in our church today, it's all about self-glorification. I saw it the other day. The, the, the title of the, the meme or the TikTok, whatever it was, said, uh, Waitress gets $1,300 Christmas gift. And she cries. And I was like, this is awesome. These two idiots <laughs> were filming themselves. Glorifying themselves, embarrassing this waitress. And they wanted to show the world how awesome they are. And I'm here to tell you right now, if that is what you are wanting to do, is to show the world how spiritual you are, you need to watch out. You don't even know what the cross is. You're chasing your self-gratification. I'm going to tell you this right now. If those guys are really doing that for the love of Christ, then she wouldn't have even known who gave her that money. That they didn't have to be glorified because it's not about them. In fact, as we go down from this point, John's baptizing all these people. And here come the religious leaders. They're not happy. Because people are coming to the church going, there's a guy down there baptizing us for repentance. And we don't even have to worry about you. And they're like, hey, you need to go find out who this guy is. So they send their guys down there and they go to John. 
And here's the thing that freaks them out. John does not look like them. John doesn't look like anybody. John, John has really got an issue with his swag. Doesn't have much swag. Hair's all jacked up, eating locusts and honey. Just different. He's odd. Right? He doesn't, listen to this, he doesn't quite fit in. And you know what? John doesn't care. They come to John, they're like, who are you? He's like, I'm John. I don't know if that was that kind of locust that he ate, but I think that's funny. <laughs> and like, who are you and why are you baptizing? And they ask him questions. Are you the Messiah? And he's like, no, 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 no. And they go, are you a prophet? And he's like, no. They even ask him, are you Elijah? And he says, no, I am not Elijah. And they went to him and they said, then what gives you the right to baptize with water? If you're not any of those things, and he began to say this, I am not him, but he is here. He is among you. You don't know him. And even John said this, I didn't even know him. And I think what John was saying was, and if you don't know this, Jesus and John are related. They're related. And once again, I'm just going to give a plug for our Wednesday nights. Come during December to Wednesday nights because we're going to break this thing down. Now, understand this. They're related, and there had to come a time when John was like, I know what my parents are saying who I am, but I really don't know if this Jesus guy is really who his parents say he is. But then God showed John the one the Spirit settles on, that's the Messiah. And that Spirit settled on Jesus. And the thing is, John knew, and that's the dude that is going to die for you and me. And the religious leaders didn't like it. So they're trying to mess with John. And John says, man, I can't even tie this guy's sandals. I baptize with water. Listen to this. He baptizes with fire, man. He's going to set you on fire. So listen to me. If you, if you want to come to this church, I'm so glad you're here. But if you expect to come to this church and just become a good citizen of Christianity, it's not going to happen. We want God to deal with us as he sees fit. We want him to break us if he needs to break us. Set us on fire if he needs to set us on fire. I know this for all of us. Lord, help us decrease so that you may increase. You see what happened after that is John's baptizing and Jesus comes in and John stands up and says, there's the Lamb of God. That's the one. And a lot of his disciples left him and followed Jesus. And some of his ride or die disciples said, this isn't fair. Why are you letting them go to that guy? And John said it. I must decrease so that he may increase. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, may we have that heart today. Lord, it's not about me. It's about you. And I don't care if people like me here or not. I don't care if I'm ever seen or not. I don't care about any of these things. I care about you. Because I come to your cross of repentance. You know what's really sad is many of us, including myself, don't understand what that cross of repentance is. Because we'll go to his cross and we'll bring our issues. We'll go to his cross and we'll complain. We'll sit there and say, Lord, why did you let that happen to me? Because I'm going to tell you right now, this is when we really start losing our focus on Jesus. When we are in suffering. When we are in suffering, you really start to find out if you're really about Jesus or still about yourself. Now, let's be honest. Some of us in this room, we create our own suffering. Amen? Amen. Let's just be honest. Lord, help us not to do that. But I'm talking about those times when you didn't create it. Like John, when he went to Herod and he told Herod the truth, Herod threw him in jail. Many of us in this room, we didn't get locked up because we did the right thing. But here, John did nothing wrong and he gets locked up. To the point, listen to this. 
later on in John or Luke chapter 7, I encourage you to read it, and I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of the time. John is still in prison. He's still in prison just for telling the truth. Know this. If you live for Jesus and you live for the truth, don't expect the world to like you. <laughs> don't. Because the world is not going to like what God does. And we should be at that point. We should no longer care what the world thinks of us as long as we're doing what is right. So here's what happens. John gets two of his ride or die disciples. They come and visit him in prison. And he says, hey, will you do me a favor? Would you go to Jesus and ask him, is he the one or should we be looking for someone else? We do the same. When our life gets tough, when things happen unfair to us, we say, Lord, that's not fair. So he sends the disciples. The disciples get to Jesus and they say, hey, John sent us to, to give you a message. Jesus says, what is it? And he says, John wants to know if you're the one or should we be looking for someone else? And Jesus doesn't even respond except to do this. He grabs somebody who's sick and they're healed. He grabs somebody who's lame and they walk. He grabs somebody who's blind and they see. And he looks at him and says, why don't you go tell John what you see? The lame walk. The blind see. The poor have been brought to salvation. And they went back to John and they told John. Do you know why I think John did that? Is because I think John's going, this isn't fair. I did what God wanted me to do and now I have to rot out in prison? Maybe so. And some of us sit there and go, well, I'm not going to sign up for that. Then okay. It's your choice. You see, this is unpopular to preach today. Who, we, we say, who will live for God? Yeah, I'll live for God. Who will suffer for him? I don't have to suffer. My God wouldn't want me to suffer. Which God you serving? Because in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. James says, count it all joy when you go into trials and tribulations, for God is perfecting you in those. Doesn't mean he put you in them. But it means when we're in them, we have a duty and a privilege to praise God. When things don't go our way. Man. It got me this week. It got me this week. When things don't go my way. I should be praising his name. Because I'm not defined here. And I wish I could tell you that man. Once John understood this man. The jail opened up and he floated out. No he was beheaded. He was beheaded because. Uh, they put his head on a silver platter. To give to the guest of a king. It's not fair. But who is going to go to God and say it's not fair? Right? Some of us in this room will yell at God. Why did you let me get a speeding ticket? Because you were speeding. But some of us, listen to me. Why did I get cancer? Why did my family member have to die? Why did they die and they live? It's not fair. And Jesus says, don't talk to me about fair. For if I give you what is fair, you will need to go build the cross and nail yourself to it. I have come to give you salvation, but don't ever think it's cheap. When you come to the cross, you will get grace. Can I get an amen? amen. You will not get condemnation. You will not get judgment that we deserve. You will get grace. But that grace is not for you to go out and not be changed. And that's what we've made modern Christianity. Come in and get forgiven, get back out and get after it. No, no, no. Come to the cross and die so that you will be made alive. Oh, guys, I'm not the same guy I used to be 10 years ago, and I praise God. But I can't tell you how I changed. I just know the more and more I focus on him, the more and more I thrive to be changed, Right? Some of us in this room, you come from a long line of impatient drivers. <laughs> right? My parents are impatient. My grandparents, my great, great, great grandparents couldn't stand people when they went slow on their horses. <laughs> come from a long line. It's just handed down. And God says, well, let's work on that. And here's the sad part about it. I just cannot be real with you on this one. 
If I go to God because I've experienced this and I say, Lord, help me to be patient in traffic. You know what? I'm going to catch every yellow light. Everybody in front of me is going to be slow. And the person on the left side of the lanes is going to need to turn right at the one time. And so I have to tell myself before I leave the house, may I decrease so that you may increase. Father, it's not about me. I use these things and we laugh about them because they're small, but I'm here to tell you right now. He has called you to his cross. For such a time as this, he has called you to his cross. And I guess if we were a real church, Pastor Allen, and I was a good pastor, we'd have this great altar call. We'd have the band come up, and we would sing, and we'd get emotional, we'd come down. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just here to tell you for here, it doesn't work like that. Because it either is real for you, or it is not. It is not me, and it's not my job to enforce you to do that. It's not me to try to pull your emotions out of you. It's my job to say, here's the word of God. What do you choose? But I'm here to tell you this. Today, if you feel like, man, I need to quit telling God I'm sorry. I need to repent. Then you need to come to me or Pastor Allen or Pastor Brian at the end of this service. And we're going to walk it out. Now, here's the thing. Don't be coming up to me to go get coffee. Saying, we're going to go get coffee. I'm going to tell you how bad my life is. You're going to feel real sorry for me. No, I'm going to kick you. (laughs) Spiritually. Spiritually. Because there's never been a time that I went to God about how hard my life is that God didn't say, you're the problem. You need to hear that. And there's been many times I've taught, I've brought to God, Lord, Help me with this person right here. Change him. And God's like, no, I need to change you. Lord, I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here to talk about them. It's called intercessory prayer, Lord. I bring them to you and you deal with them. God's like, no, I'm dealing with you. Because when you come to my cross, it is me and you. You can bring to me all your cares. Because I care about them. But it's going to be about you and me. And you're going to learn to trust me. You're going to learn to be obedient to me. And in that, you will find life that you can't even fathom. That you'll start changing in ways that you tried but didn't know you could. And as you go, all you can do because you're so full of his joy is have a heart full of gratitude instead of complaining. Now, if you're ready to go on that journey... Refuge is here to walk it with you. You need to walk it with me. We are God's refuge. May we be a church and a people who are not afraid to repent. Say, Lord, change me. Some of you in this room right now, you've been changed so much where you came from, they don't even recognize you anymore. But they still talk noise. It's not real. They're going to mess up again. That's fine. I don't care what the world says. I just focused on what God says. Amen. Pass around and go ahead and come up. Know this, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus spoke about John. See, because the prophet Isaiah said that Elijah must return before the Messiah, and they hadn't seen Elijah. So his disciples went up and they said, Hey, where is he? And Jesus said, Out of every person born of the flesh, there will be no greater person than John. Nobody's better than John. On your best day, you don't even come close to John. And you know what Jesus also said? Even the least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than John. It's not about here. It's about there. So may we say, Father, may I decrease so that you can increase. Amen. Amen. Pastor Al. Stand with me. Let us pray in agreement. Who do we pray to? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father God, we love you. Master, we stand together in declaration. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. God, that you would increase and we would decrease. That you would manifest your glory amongst us, God. That the world might know that we, God, would be a people about your name. A people, God, who are, who are salt and light to a lost and dying world. A people who love you and recognize your love for us. God, that is our prayer. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. In this place, amongst his people, in agreement with your kingdom in the world, that we can be a testimony and a testament of that is our great prayer. So with that, God, would you bless and keep each of us and all of us? Would you cause your face to shine upon us? Be gracious, Lord, to us. Turn your countenance again to us. And let the peace of God that passes understanding be established in the homes, the lives of this your people. We declare it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. God bless you all.